Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. So we're gonna do a project update seminar, so everyone's gonna give a short presentation. Some, the first presenters are farther along and have been working with their project for a little over a year, and so they'll get 15 minute presentations, and then the newest batch that hopefully received funding, just received, or will receive funding very soon, <laughs> um, will give shorter presentations that are a lot more forward looking about what they're planning on working on. And the idea of having these seminars is to increase collaboration amongst the funded projects for people to hear what other people are working on and get ideas about how they can expand their research. So we're going to start with the SAPSIS project, which Carolina Bastidas from MITC Grant will present. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Carolina Bastidas, and on behalf of the ISAPSIS, I'm going to present an update of the results of this project uh, for the first two working groups. And uh, then Ken is going to present uh, results for the modeling group. Um, so this is a multidisciplinary collaboration that involves researchers from MIT, from MIT Sea Grant, from University of Pittsburgh, uh, Brown University, um, UMass Dartmouth, and uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. So the, the goal of, of the project is to support a cost-effective monitoring program to better understand and predict the ocean um, acidification in the coastal environments. And for this, uh, we're using a, a framework that incorporates a theory and a modeling <coughs> to put together different data sources of different type of fidelity. And <coughs> we have used this scheme since we started this project where we uh, combine different um, um, levels of um, uh, accuracy, let's say, uh, sensors from sounds, from data, sat from satellite data, um, ethical models like the one developed by Chen, more sensitive methods like ETHED sensors or lab analysis for water bottles. And those and all these are components um, into the modeling framework. <coughs> so as in the past year and the past year, this year we are strongly being supported by uh, the Massachusetts Water Research Authority uh, because they are providing us with the sampling and uh, water quality parameters from Massachusetts Bay. So they are basically covering, covering all these stations and from the four that one has that has crosses, they are providing us with uh, water samples that are then analyzed for total alkalinity and dissolving organic carbon. And as I say, they also provide other uh, water quality parameters for the rest of the sampling that they have. Uh, so from that, from that past year, the results are basically um, uh, for deep water summarized here. So this is what we obtained for dissolving organic carbon uh, from this water sampling uh, obtained by uh, MWRA. And we have the different months of the year that were sampled in, this, in the x-axis and each group in the month is um, one station, and they are organized from inshore to offshore. So what we can see is that um, basically we observe higher DIC as we move offshore, that is uh, with, uh, consistent with results that have been found in the region for the Gulf of Maine. And that pattern is kind of broken by August, 
which is also consistent with previous results. And we have a kind of more variation um, for the insure um, stations uh, in the DIC through, through time. We, uh, so this is this, the, the left um, panel is the same as the previous one. And I wanted to show here was uh, that if we see also a different uh, depth in the water column, the shallow water and the mid water together with the deep water, we, we see the expectations of having a higher DIC or certain organic carbon for uh, deeper uh, waters, like in the, on the left. So they are all on the same scale, up to uh, 2150 micromoles per, kilo, per kilogram of seawater. <clears throat> so up to this time of the year, um, the uh, stations behave as predicted with more DIC in deeper waters. And then um, this pattern is broken in August. So from August onward, we see that shallow waters become more enriched with DIC, which is also um, <coughs> kind of what we have seen uh, in the Gulf of Maine other, by other researchers like Salisbury or uh, Vandemark or Kai or Wang, uh, which have characterized uh, Gulf of Maine waters. And they have seen this reverse in August, where <coughs> with the mixing, the start of the mixing of the waters, <coughs> we lost this uh, pattern of uh, lower um, DIC in shallow waters. <coughs> and also like shallow waters we call like a source of CO2 to the environment at that time. Uh, CO2 if blocks. So, oops. Oh, sorry. So basically uh, these are the same results on the same way uh, graphed, uh, but in this case by total alkalinity. And uh, what we wanted to show with this is they behave more or less in the same way as the IC in respect of this inshore offshore gradient and their behavior in shallow, mid, and deep water. Um, <coughs> and um, the inshore grade, offshore gradient is kind of clearer in the deeper water again. Um, so basically, we have more or less the same behavior as for um, the IC. <coughs> So for 2018, we plan to continue what we did, what we did on 2017 on the collection of the data with uh, the Deer Island uh, buoy, which is, um, this is, this is the location, this is Deer Island, and this is the buoy location. This is the Logan Airport and, um, in Boston Harbor. And this, this buoy is collecting meteorological data, uh, um, uh, irradiance, wind, uh, speed, um, and it's also equipped with a zone for some of the um, water quality parameters in the water, like chlorophyll and DO. And what is different from this from uh, the previous year is that this year the, the zone is also equipped with high fidelity sensors for uh, pH and pCO2. So these are all the water sensors uh, summit that will provide um, these measurements every 30 minutes or every um, hour for pH and this uh, buoy is already in place and has been collecting data uh, hopefully uh, since June, June uh, um, since the middle of this June. So <clears throat> what is also a bit different from last year is we, we want to increase um, a bit of the effort we are doing within the Boston Harbor. So we are adding a few sites besides the, uh, the buoy that is here. We are adding some other stations that are also coupled with the MWR scheme of sampling to have the data that they are also collecting as part of the metadata that is uh, that will accompany these water bottle samples for TA and DIC. And um, uh, we are also continuing this year, um, as last year, with the collection that is particular on the mouth of the confluence of the mouth of the Mystic River, I'm sorry, the Charles River, the Mystic River, and the union of the two in Boston Harbor. So what we're doing there is we are profiling autonomously with, um, with, a, with, a, with a sound that is attached to this underwater uh, auto, autonomous uh, surface vehicle, Rex. Um, and we uh, sometimes couple that um, autonomous profiling with the collection of water samples for TA and DSC analysis again. Okay, so uh, for the update of, of what we've done on the on this part of the, of the of the working of the working group, there has been a lot of uh, progress with the uh, 
the exploration of the relationships among the variables uh, that we are uh, interested in, and uh, how are their correlations in space and time. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show quickly uh, three examples of what, what have been uh, the results of some of these um, explorations. So for example, here we are uh, modeling the pH. So the red line is, is the model of pH and the, um, the pink values, the pink uh, shadow is the two, uh, the um, standard deviation from that model. On the top, uh, so on, on the X axis is the time in days from one to 250 more or less. So it's basically trying to model the seasonality of the pH variation this is Mass Bay again, and this is, uh, these are the same stations that um, MWRA is uh, sampling. So basically, in the first um, example, so in the first example on the top, um, all, the, all these dots are the stations, and the data is modeled using those, ex those points, except this N07. Uh, and on the on the bottom panel, we are doing the same, but in this time using all the all the stations except these uh, F10 samples, which are the test um, um, data. The test data is represented here and here with the blue dots. So basically, we, what we can see from the top and the bottom is that on the top we obtain much better uncertainty values across along uh, along the model, and basically is due to the fact that this is kind of less space resolution for this uh, particular station, whereas this station is well situated among other stations and the spatial resolution here is much better, so it gives a better modeling approach for um, modeling um, pH. All right, the second one is, the second example has to do with this, um, is um, an example of temperature. So similar as in the previous one, the red line is the uh, temperature model uh, with the Gaussian process uh, machine learning um, uh, modeling. And we are using these stations very close together that are here. And this is to show, this is one station and this is the other. And this is to show if we are only using uh, in situ data, we, can, we obtain this type of uncertainty around the model. If we combine the in situ data with the satellite data, which is one of the um, approaches used by the, by, the, by, the, by the team, which is combine different uh, sources of data, we obtain a much better uncertainty around the, those values. <coughs> Finally, uh, the last um, of these examples of modeling, um, we used uh, a, a whole data series for the A01 buoy of um, the Gulf of Maine uh, buoy uh, monitoring program. And um, in this case, it's about eight years of data from the zero to 3,000. And we use part of the data for training and the rest for forecast. And this is mostly to exemplify how by choosing different uh, type of currents for modeling, uh, we can obtain better results for the uncertainty. For example, here we can see that with this type of, this is with what one type of kernel and this is with the other type of kernel. In this case, we can see the uncertainty values are really high and we really didn't capture uh, or were able to forecast properly the temperature data. Whereas we, if we use a periodic kernel, we better, uh, <laughs> sorry about that, we better capture the seasonality of the, of the, of the temperature. Right. Okay, and this is to illustrate how we kind of, it's a picture of how we uh, think about illust um, um, estimating some of the parameters and how to incorporate them in this modeling effort with a final goal, of course, of uh, improving the predictive capability for the carbonate variables in the, in the coastal environments and to be able to support this uh, cost-effective monitoring program that uh, we'd like to support at the end of the project. And with that, uh, Chen will be uh, explaining some of the um, results. I can make the talk much shorter because this is a, just a, we try to develop a you know, biogeochemistry model to, uh, for the study, for the program. 
it's a really tough job. It's not easy, to be honest. So we try to do the beginning, we thought it was easy. And then finally, we find that you know, biological model take much more time you know, to do this. So what happened, you know, so the objective, you know, we said, you know, is region. Later, I talk about this region. So we do this, you know, the, the kind of ocean certification, but we don't have a really biology chemistry model here, the last region. So, you know, so we don't really, we can collect the data, you know, we can use some kind of theoretical model to make prediction, but it's really hard to understand what's a complex, you know, biology chemistry process as a control system. So we don't really, really know how complicated they are. So most interesting for us, we try to understand the special and the temporary, you know, the changes, variabilities. So, so that's the reason we do this. We try to do the one thing, so we try to set the model. You know, European group already working with us for many, many years. There has been set up an ecosystem model. You know, you, you use our coding develop, but they apply their region. Because the biological model is different from the physical model. You can develop the program, apply the different region. Biological model you have to do, you have to you have to different region, have different kind of way to drive in. That's why you get a coding sample, parameter can be changes. That's why they have a called a European ecosystem model called the ERSM. So we use their framework developed for the kind of kind of northeast uh, you know, biogeochemistry in the, and the ecosystem model, we the end called the NAMB. Okay, okay, we 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 call it called the NIB. Okay, NIB 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 is uh, the regional model that I talk about this. Now we try to configure the mass bay with the observation data, see how good this model is. It'll take a lot of time, okay? So we try to validate, later on we try to cover the whole region. To review the issue here, is you no know, mass bay is a little bit complicated, you know, like other region. So we had a circulation go down for Gabbay region, the blue line just showed a circulation. So most of the difficulty time, you know, we had a Boston Harbor here, Region, we also have a NWI, you know, kind of waste water outflow. So they have a you know, waste you know, pipe over here. They come out a lot of nutrients and come over here. So that's the basic circulation we have. So this region is very interesting. You know, the winter time is completely, you know, so maybe mix it. Okay, the water temperature is really poor, but in the summer time it's really dry. By. So what happened, you know? The reason was uh, we, we select a mass bay to study, you know, so, you know, I don't probably, they get a lot of, uh, you know, NWI has been monitoring the ecosystem water quality conditions since 1992, the they still continue to do. But because of the, that's the variables they measures, they get a lot of variable measures, they get DO, you know, they get all other variables, you know, the variable, but most of the focus are DO. So then the problem of uh, budget cut, they continue to cut all the station. Now it's a picture like this way, but now it's not the main station anymore. Okay, so what are we doing here? So we have to set up for the mass space system. That's an ocean forecast system, like a you know, physical ocean system. We have a global, that's the regional, then the mass space region. The red line here is the water quality model that has been used to working on this. But then the system has been built. We do the 40 year simulation. You know, we have this region, you know, and uh, so that's, that's, that's 45 layers, you know, we get a vertical layer. So we have a whole power running, we do the prediction temperature seeing here, the circulation. So we do have a physical model available. So that's what makes us, you know, say, oh, we can do the you nose know, kind of geochemistry model. So then we have been working you yeah, in NWI. We have a developer called UGRCA, originally come from the RCA model, the water quality model region. So this model, you know, it's like a typical water quality model. Don't include the pH, okay, don't include the PCO2. I just quickly go through there, the up level is the phytoplankton, okay. This model is much easier to tune the model because the up level is the phytoplankton. Everything you don't like, put the sink tank, okay. So you can take out everything you don't like it. That's why the model to the, to, to the, to the pretty good job, that's the basic thing. So we work in the region. I just quickly review why we do this new model. We do the region here, so they can see we can do the pretty good for the physical model for temperature salinity, the buoy data there. That's the that's the you know surface temperature that's the bottom. Now you can see the summer times really stratified. Okay, the sea 
The winter time the completely mixes, summer time dry the fire. So we do the many, many years simulation for DO. I quickly go through there, the surface of the bottom. You can see the model can do the pre good DO, okay? But then we get a, you know, like a, like a surface, like a coffee concentration, you know, dissolve in the in body, you know, in the the night nitrogen. It's pretty, it's okay. But look at the picture, it's okay, right? But pay carefully. You see the how big variability to observation. You know, model the insurance observation, but as a observation, you know, the data is very, you know, change a lot, okay? So, so then you look about, you know, we find there's a limitation. Now we, some people, Department of Energy, has to use the UGRC, the model, like equals the model directed for the you know, ocean certification study. What they do, they have a water quality model predicted in a whole, uh, you know, like a, like a bi you know, you know, biological parameter. They use kind of empirical function to fit like a prediction of PCO2, you know, all of the pH. Okay, that's the one way they do that. But then we also propose, when we start a program, we find you know, a European group has been developed a very complicated you know, ecosystem model. That's a system model over there. They do include all of the health, you know, organics. They, the inorganic is a whole common the basic on the physical driving, then also pH and the PCO2 process. This model has been developed more than 10 years. Okay, has been used the European side. This is a pretty good result. That's why we can, we can we said, okay, because we had to work in the team for a long time, we sort of why not use the model server in our area. So that's region, we direct the price of model to the northeast region, but because we don't want to confuse people, that it's a European system, okay? So it's northeast system, but then we, we nail the name called the northeast biogeochemistry ecosystem model. So we do this one here. So important, this model is different for UGRC, it's include the Biogeochemistry process directed driving the pH. So, to we set the model easily, the quickly, but the problem is the how to validate the model. Okay, the model has uh, so many parameters there. Okay, I think the parameter has more than two hundred. Okay, you don't know which one is correct, but the, all the biology people told us that's correct. But then you look at the range is bigger. So okay. So we, we don't know how to do it. That's why we said a lot of testing the 1D experiments. Just a look at the 1D, what is the 1D? You get a surface heating, get the wind, like a mixing, do a lot, many year round, see how the model performance is. So we select the two sides. One side is, you know, inside the Boston Harbor. Another side is outside, okay? And the, all the open boundaries is reaching there. That's a kind of buoy. A data there our station knows F22 as a long time you know, history, the data there. So we do the simulation, I just quickly show the result to you. Okay, well first time we face excited. Because around the model we say, okay, started 1995 to 2016. You see that that's the PCO2, you know, from data. You look like a pretty good. So then we work in MIT Group. group. We said, let's do the 2017. Okay, can we predict that? So that's the 2017, the PCO2 data. That's the model we know. <laughs> we don't know which <laughs> size we want, right? Probably we want, okay? But in the 2017, if the data is correctly, you see the PCO2 is significantly high than previous year, right? So the model we do the whole thing there, we can do the pretty good job in the past, but now with this one, we really don't know. Okay, that's a 1D simulation. So probably have a geochemistry expert here, so we can ask them what's happened. Okay, okay, one I quickly, okay. So then what happened, we, we do the piece, we do the P the pH, we do the shallow water region, we see the, the model can do the pretty good for P pH in the shallow region. Okay, even some other things wrong, but pH look like pretty good in shallow water. Because I only had one minute, so I, I quickly go through. <laughs> so, you know, so
So then we do the 3D experiment. So okay, let's go ahead and do the 3D. Make sure the model running. Then we come back to figure out what is really wrong, okay? So now, we do the 3D simulation. I just show you this one. So then we complete temperature CAT. We find this temperature CAT, the surface of the body is pretty good. But CAT has some problem for shallow water. CAT not very really good for shallow water. So then what happened? So we do the, compare the pH in the all station. All the station there, okay? So what happened, you look like, you know, surface look like, you know, it's very close to observation. However, the model show a lot of variability, high frequency variability, okay? A lot of variability, keep the variability there. This is why we need to figure out what's really going on. But at least you can see the model show the chain for 3D. So then you see that, you know, for the bottom, it's pretty good. The bottom is pretty good, the surface has a problem. Okay, surface so model show too much variability. So then we do this one here. We also compare with the, no, no, the nitrate. Look at the surface, the station there is pretty good. Okay, so then you see the ammonia, and the ammonia, and also like a, there's a surface bottom, the phosphate. Is all this one, the silicon is pretty good. But then the question come out, why be so many, you know, this kind of variability? You know, so then, Okay, I just want to quickly go through there. We continue to debug the 3D model. The model takes much more time, but the one thing I want to give you, no any geo biology chemistry model in the Northeast region. Now the NOVA wanted this model, so we, I showed the results of NOVA. NOVA said, okay, even the model still so trashy right now, but we want you to continue to develop. The reason because it's good for the Northeast region. Okay, that's why, so we want to develop bugger, we need, to, we need to input the CD simulation in inside the bay to make sure that then we also, we need to test the different methods using the model to cut the pH pCO2. There are the five methods of cut the pCH2 there. We find one is working, another is not working. So some, another, we turn the third one, it's just blew up. So we still testing. We're working with the uh, UUK group right now. We get every day the email conversation and uh, there then to change the model, make the models better. Okay, thank you. our research progress about sensors for measuring carbon dioxide and bicarbonate and pH in oceans. Um, our PI is Professor Tim Swagger in chemistry department and we are working uh, with Professor Jeff Lang in electrical engineering and computer science. My name is Sun Jin Choi, um, I'm presenting today and we are uh, working together with graduate students Samuel and Vera and another postdocs which will so our um, goal is to understand ocean acidification. As we know, um, carbon dioxide is easily dissolved in water, producing hydrogen ions and lowering pH in ocean. And here is very one interesting data. Uh, when you see uh, this data, the carbon dioxide and pH level is quite constant over the uh, last uh, past 800,000 years. But uh, we are expecting dramatic changes after about 100 years later, uh, lowering pH level. Um, this is quite a um, serious issue and pretty much obvious um, that the pH is lowering uh, significantly for the next years, uh, down to 7.8. Uh, when you uh, expose seashell in pH around 7.8, you see you know, decomposition of shells. So uh, it eventually affects my life food chain and it will affect also food chain of human as well. So we have very uh, well developed uh, carbon dioxide monitoring system uh, but the major issues would be the operational complexity and costs of maintenance. So we are aiming to develop sensing platform 
uh, they can monitor ocean acidification, uh, probably, possibly, with a low cost, simple, portable, and uh, low power consumption. So there are basically four analytical uh, parameters uh, to understand the total carbon dioxide system in the ocean. Uh, the first one is total uh, dissolved inorganic carbon. Uh, there is a summation of carbon dioxide concentration and bicarbonate and carbonate. At current pH level around 8.1, uh, bicarbonate count 90% and carbonate count like 10%. And other parameters like um, pH, total alkalinity, and uh, carbon dioxide pressure. Um, any of these two, uh, uh, any of pair of these parameters can, you know, um, give us uh, entire ocean system information. So we are trying to measure uh, bicarbonate and carbonate and pH level in the ocean to understand uh, total carbon dioxide concentration in the ocean. So we are uh, proposing a molecule that can selectively bind bicarbonate, uh, which is bicyclic cyclopane, that has, has unique structure uh, that can capture bicarbonate inside a molecule. Uh, this molecule has six hydrogen that can donate hydrogen bonding to the lone pair pi electrons uh, in bicarbonate. So um, bicarbonate can locate the center of molecule. Geometrically, uh, geometrically uh, favorable to capture inside uh, the cavity, so we are expecting to uh, capture bicarbonate. And another molecule is uh, that we are designed is cationic polymer. Uh, they can attract anion, anionic uh, species like bicarbonate, and filter the cationic ions such as uh, sodium, potassium, calcium. That are abundant in seawater. So by combining these two um, molecules, polymer, uh, we set up a bicarbonate sensing platform uh, that basically having three electrodes working, reference and counter electrode. And we deposit our molecules uh, on the working electrode and measure potential changes between reference and working electrode. To understand the bicarbonate sensing property, we set up the condition uh, we use buffer solution to maintain a pH constant, pH 8, and we use a 0.1 molar bicarbonate solution <laughs> with different concentration. Uh, this is a potential metric titration method, and these two graphs shows the result using that platform with our uh, sensing material. Um, basically, the same data uh, uh, monitoring <coughs> potential changes in time scale and bicarbonate concentration. Um, you see uh, very uh, large potential changes under um, the titration uh, with bicarbonate, um, which is good because the sensing material is sensitive to bicarbonate. And we observe um, relatively low, lower um, sensing property for sodium chloride, which is a major interfering analyte in seawater. And we are proposing a um, differential amplifier to amplify the bicarbonate sensing signal. So we use a commercialized semiconductor chip that basically having a uh, four field effect transistor. And to evaluate the amplification um, capability, uh, we connect the sensor and reference electrode and we intentionally um, induce sine wave to the sensing electrode and we measure the output voltage uh, that comes from the field effect transistor to see the amplification uh, capability. So here in this graph, uh, the blue line is the signal that we introduced to the chip, and the black line is the, the signal that we measure the output voltage that is substantially amplified um, through the semiconductor chip. And you can also control the amplification, the amplitude, by simply changing the register at the output. So by changing from one kilo ohm to 10 kilo ohm, you see the amplification changes um, just by simply changing the register. And you can also minimize the noise and drift uh, by uh, inducing the same wave function to the sensing electrode. So you can um, reduce 
uh, the flow, ocean flow effect uh, that potentially uh, make drift or noise. So using this platform, um, we, um, as you can see in this photo, it's a semiconductor chip, and I use a 50K ohm register and two nine, nine volt battery. And I connect the wires to the sensing electrode uh, to measure by carbon sensing. So it, which is pretty much a simple sensing platform. So uh, after injection of bicarbonate in different concentration, you see uh, potential changes. And I compare uh, the potential changes with and without differential amplifier, and you understand significantly improve uh, potential changes with the differential amplifier to over 30%, over uh, 30 times amplitude. So let me move on to pH sensing. Uh, we propose tungsten oxide as a pH sensing material as tungsten oxide can react with hydrogen ion that form hydrogen tungstate uh, by intercollision and deintercollision of hydrogen ions into the tungsten oxide, a metal oxide crystal structure. And we are um, proposing tungsten oxide nanostructure, that is nanofiber, which is um, the diameter of tungsten oxide nanofiber is 1,000 times smaller than human hair. That means we can uh, use a large surface area and porosity uh, to capture hydrogen ion effectively. So basically the same sensing setup. We simply change the sensing uh, material at the working electrode and we use um, a polymer that we designed uh, to increase the mechanical stability. And it has large free volume uh, so that you can um, detect hydrogen ions effectively. So uh, basically we measure pH changes, I mean uh, potential changes in different pH uh, level from pH 3 to 11, you see stepwise um, potential changes in different pH level. And for the ocean acidification, um, this blue box is actually our interest. So we um, scan the pH changes and potential changes uh, within this uh, narrow pH, change, uh, pH range. And it's quite reproducible uh, using is tungsten oxide uh, sensing, pH sensing layer. And we um, try to understand the pH changing using artificial sea water. So we prepare um, artificial sea water that basically is sodium chloride and other uh, cation and anion species such as potassium and magnesium and sulfate. So the artificial sea water, the pH is around 8.45 and we continuously add bicarbonate to the artificial sea water and monitor pH changes. And this sensor showed quite um, reproducible uh, pH change under different bicarbonate concentration. So we're gonna use this calibration curve for uh, further analysis um, using the real sea water. As um, um, another sensing platform, we are proposing uh, resistive type anion sensing uh, platform, uh, which is simple and smaller than the current version. Um, we are using carbon nanotube with different selectors that can also donate hydrogen bond to attract anion species. This is very small uh, design and has a um, small chamber uh, that is the diameter is 3.5 millimeter that can contain a very small amount of water uh, that can detect also anion species. So, so far we developed bicarbonate pH uh, sensors um, and the current uh, challenges will be the selectivity of the cur current uh, sensing platform. Uh, we have to um, look into more about the bicarbonate selective property uh, against other interfering species such as sodium and chloride, sulfate, nitrate. And we developed differential amplifier, so uh, hopefully you can use this uh, platform uh, to amplify bicarbonate sensing uh, property in real sea water. We haven't really thought about pressure condition, like ocean flow and ocean bubbles, 
um, yeah, you have to uh, look into more about stability uh, after we obtain uh, sensitivity and selectivity. Right. With that, um, thank you for your attention. Anyway. <laughs> Tungsten oxide um, fiber electrode, it seemed to be relatively unresponsive over the 7 to 9 pH range compared to the other, no, uh, uh, the, the previous one. Yeah, um, yeah, it, that's the um, disadvantage of tungsten oxide. Um, maybe uh, there's some literature about uh, pH sensing property of tungsten oxide that's showing the unstable sensing property in within that reason. So yeah, any other metal oxide can be used for pH sensing. So tungsten oxide wouldn't be the best choice for pH sensing. So maybe you can try with different uh, metal oxide. You have to still optimize the pH sensing property. Yes. Yes. Do you have a sense of what's the uh, response time of your uh, uh, sensor? Sorry. Response time. Response time. Yeah. Uh, it was it's very fast actually. Um, like um, when I wait within five minutes, um, it saturate pretty much. Um, five minutes. Yeah, but um, once I have to stabilize the sensor, you know, just stabilize in buffer solution on seawater, artificial seawater, uh, like a half an hour, or an hour, and then. If I add some amount of bicarbonate, then saturate within like five minutes. The response is itself quite fast, but I have to stabilize initially. Uh, another question is, uh, what, do, you, do you have, I mean, I guess this is still uh, the initial stage, but do you have a sense of what's the uh, detection limit, for example, for bicarbonate? For the bicarbonate, um, I try to uh, use, I start to use 0.2 millimole. Um, this is what I got, um, the lowest concentration of our carbon. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. thank you so much. Heavy traffic on the way and this way. Uh, so uh, I'm Alec Wang from Hui, and um, so we're gonna give you an update on the DIC sensor and PCO2 sensor we're working on. So I have my student uh, uh, Mallory Ringham here. So I'm gonna give an overview first, uh, and then uh, Mallory gonna update for a lot of details. Um, so I showed this uh, last time, but just get everyone uh, on the same page. I think that. Um, the previous uh, speaker had a pretty good pre uh, introduction on the ocean acidification. Just remind people, uh, ocean acidification, uh, it's, it's, it's a quick change uh, for a lot of things, but analytically it's, a, it's a still a challenge to measure because the, the signal is relatively small. So you have um, you know, always a pH change on the order of uh, 0.01 to 0.03 globally in the open ocean per year and CO2 track the uh, uh, atmosphere CO2 increase pretty well in the surface ocean. That's about two micro uh, atmosphere. And in terms of DAC, which is, uh, we sometimes call the, uh, the CO2 penetrate the, the ocean surface, uh, sometimes can go thousands of meters, but sometimes in the north uh, east of Pacific, for example, it can only uh, go uh, several hundred meters. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the surface, uh, if they track, if it's a track the, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, that's on the order of uh, one or two uh, micromole uh, DAC per year. Um, and, uh, but there are hot spots. So those are the kind of the conditions um, to start with. I'm a carbon chemist, so uh, if I want to measure things like this, uh, that's, that's kind of at the back of my mind. I want to detect this. But obviously there's other purpose, uh, not just the ocean certification. So, um, 
Uh, again, this is the four parameters uh, we want. Uh, this would be described uh, for a CO2 system. And, uh, and the way to design this is because uh, they can be uh, relatively easy to measure uh, in high precision. Uh, and there are other ways to measure systems, but uh, as in the ocean environment, the precision usually is not good enough. So that's a long story, but at the end, people uh, settle down to the four parameters. Uh, at least at this moment, um, those four parameters can be measured in a, in a precision that uh, corresponding to the ocean's, uh, ocean certification uh, type of uh, purpose. Uh, so, but uh, we know that uh, you need to measure two parameters to, uh, to uh, define the whole system, and along with the temperature and salinity all that. Uh, but uh, which parameter, which two uh, matters because uh, it's not ideal mathematically. It's, uh, you can do that, but uh, uh, in a you know, non uh, ideal situation, there's a lot of things uh, can uh, uh, skewer the, your uh, calculation in this system. So it turned out that DAC uh, is a master parameter a lot of people like to measure. Uh, number one is because um, it has its own you know, purpose. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to see what is the carbon invasion, for example, and other about your chemical process, uh, how that affects the DAC uh, budget. And the other is obviously that the pH and uh, uh, oxygen, uh, pH and PCO2. If you combine uh, uh, DAC and PCO2 or pH, your calculation is pretty uh, solid. Uh, so that, that's uh, what, why the people want to measure pH as one of the parameter. Unfortunately, uh, commercially, you only have right now pH and PCO2 sensors. Uh, so that, that's, that's not ideal. Um, so that does push us to, uh, to look at the, the DAC sensors. Uh, the way the DAC measure at this moment, I mean, there, there's a new uh, way to measure DAC and bicarbonate, but the traditional way this I listed here, there's a, this is actually a Mallory's work. So, um, so you have uh, your seawater sample, you, you can uh, isolate the CO2 in different ways. Uh, you can acidify it, that's one of them. And after acidifying, you can purge the CO2 out or equilibrate CO2 out. Uh, some way, and then you can detect it either uh, you know you know spec, infrared uh, chromatography. So those those are kind of thing. But uh, pay attention to the red, and that's what we did. Uh, what we do: seawater acidify and uh, use a pH indicator to uh, monitor uh, the pH and convert it to DIC. So a couple of uh, plus, which is easy works with at a depth can be small. A similar method for all of the four parameters, so you can make things small and uh, modular, uh, conserve power. Uh, because it's an optical method and a reagent, as long as your reagent uh, not changing, it's uh, calibration free. Uh, so it le uh, you know, at least uh, you, can, you do not need, uh, need to uh, calibrate very often in the field. Um, but the downside is uh, it's, it's a wet chemistry, right? So you need uh, pumps and valves. So that, that's an increased complexity. But in terms of sensitivity, it's pretty good. So we developed the first version, and uh, those numbers uh, have been published. It's pretty good. Then we deploy in the coast the water, and this is the, uh, and we did the, uh, uh, the tidal marsh study. This has been uh, under review, actually. Um, so the, the first version designed for the, um, the fixed platform like buoys, uh, time series, for example. Uh, it's a pretty big, and so you can see this is the uh, kind of size of a uh, um, uh, suitcase. So just give an example. Um, other than ocean certification, you know, you can use the sensor like this and this kind to do a lot of things. Uh, and this is to give you an example. Uh, we did just, uh, this is under review. Um, I think it's pretty significant. For example, in this deployment, we deployed the first version of uh, channels in the uh, uh, tidal creek, uh, so to measure the tidal export of DAC flux uh, from sort marshes. Uh, this is actually the first time anyone can measure high resolution DAC flux out of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, tidal marsh system directly. And then we can use the direct measurement to, to uh, calibrate the model measurement, which is the, uh, the pink uh, lines here. And also guide us to uh, to uh, how we sample the um, the tidal cycle. You know this this is uh, interesting. So if you want to set, uh, sample a tidal cycle of twelve hours, okay, and then your strategy is go out there every fifteen minutes 
and take uh, samples, you have your chance about 90% to capture your flux uh, pretty well, okay? Uh, but if you kind of lazy, cut off four hours, even you do 15 minutes interval, you lose the uh, you know, majority of your possibility to capture uh, the, uh, the, uh, the DIC flux, right? Uh, the, the normal, uh, peop, you know, the, the, this has been in you know, literature for a long time, you know, 12 hour sampling, six minutes interval, and that's only give you about 30% of possibility to get your uh, flux rate. That's, that's uh, within 25% uh, percent of your, uh, of the true direct measurement, so-called true, okay? So I'm gonna uh, give this to Mallory. So, sure. so this um, kind of take over the the new development. Right. So I'm Mallory. I'm a PhD student on this project. So I've been handling a lot of the day-to-day -day development of this sensor. And uh, right now, our current goals are to work on version two of this channels. So we want to reduce size, power consumption, and of course the overall cost. Um, we're hoping specifically to put this on mobile platforms like Sentry uh, CTDs, as well as being able to put them on moored or uh, stationary objects so that we can get fast, dynamic coastal regions marked down. Um, we're aiming for DIC and PCO2. Uh, right now, we're avoiding pH because we do like to work in coastal regions, so low salinity and turbid areas aren't really the best for those sorts of measurements. Um, PCO2 is also really good if we're also working with DIC. They have similar methods as long as we just don't acidify and use a different indicator. We can pretty much use the same equipment. Um, so the overall principle of our measurement relies on a equilibration across a semi-permeable membrane. So we essentially have a Teflon tubing running through uh, an inert shell. And through the tubing, we pump indicator. And through the shell, we, we pump acidified sample. And we just allow CO2 to equilibrate across those and then we measure an optical spectrum of this indicator after it's equilibrated. And in that way, we don't actually have to measure the sample at all, so we don't have to worry as much about filtration and impurities and bubbles and these sorts of things because we know what our indicator started as. Um, so our, our guiding equation for this is up here. We're trying to calculate DIC by the measurement of this R, which is an absorbance ratio. And everything else in this expression is going to be either a constant that's calibrated to temperatures or a function that we can just determine in the lab beforehand, and we don't have to do as much calibration in the field because this is obstacle. Uh, so this is an idea of what this sensor looks like on the bench. Um, we have a sensor box that's about yay big, so maybe 15 inches by 10 inches. We have a pressure housing. We have a laptop associated with that. Um, here's another better view of this. Um, we're aiming to put this on um, on its own out in marshes this summer. So we have a tentative frame layout that will allow us to do that. We can also put this on CTD rosette soon. Um, so this is a tentative layout. We don't exactly know where the CTD is going to sit just yet, but you can get an idea of the size. From our previous generation, Chanos, this is now half the size of that sensor to begin with, and it's battery powered. Um, so a closer look at this sensor box, you can see that the components of this sensor are cheap off the shelf as much as possible. So we're buying micro pumps, we're buying valves, that we can then put in little oil-filled pressure housings and then submerge underwater so that we're getting in situ measurements at the temperature of the samples that we're trying to gather. And you can see this equilibration cell is this peak loop that's going over on top of our optical cell, which is just this little guy here. Um, so we measure the spectra of the indicator as it comes out, and you can see this is kind of our web user interface for the sensor, so we can control the sensor manually or automatic, and we're measuring absorbance and spectra over time, um, this particular panel is showing the reference spectra and then the equilibrated indicator after it's passed through the sample loop. Um, so what we've been doing for the past year, our past six months since the last one of these meetings, has been largely working on stability and improving the pumps, improving the consistency of this device. So the uh, most time consuming process that we've been dealing with is how do you get a cheap off the shelf pump that can do this kind of high precision metering that we want. Um, so we're working on recirculation schemes that allow us to do that and allow us to conserve reagent. Uh, but in general, we do a pretty good job of getting slow mass flow rates uh, over a longer period of time, which is what we're hoping for. Um, we can also speed up our measurements by working with a percent equilibration instead of allowing all of our CO2 to equilibrate back and forth across this membrane. And the idea here is if we flow our indicator and our sample slowly enough, we can get near 100% equilibration, but that takes a long time. So if we calibrate this beforehand in the lab, we can work on faster and faster measurements because we know how much we've equilibrated. So uh, 
An example of what this looks like if you're measuring up your absorbances, your absorbance ratio, which we calculate DIC from over time, we can work at maybe an hour at a given period before we have to start worrying about uh, baseline drift. And then we have to take references, which don't take very long with this method at all. Our current stability is about six micromole per kilogram, which is pretty good. We're working on getting this down to two micromole or so. Um, so a quick summary of this, we have got a decent prototype sensor that is working on a bench top now. Um, we're working on packaging this and getting this out in the field. Uh, we are doing some improvements on the micropump consistency. How do we recirculate? How do we improve this this way? We're trying to get this out into the marsh again this summer, and we have uh, some ambitious goals to get this out in the Red Sea back in October. And I think that's probably time. <laughs> Um, what's the weight of uh, channel stool or <laughs> the expected one? Expected weight. So the battery is the main thing. The battery mm -hmm. alone weighs 40 pounds. So that's a you know decent piece. But you can pick up the tube, the entire frame with the sensor. And so it's like the car pounds. battery and then plus the sensor. Right. Um, that battery is really rated down to 3,000 meters. So that's probably why it's uh, so heavy. It's a titanium housing. But the sensor itself with all the reagent bags, 30 pounds at most. Right. Um, so we can balance that out on a CTD frame. Probably no issues. So the battery is uh, optional. Uh, yeah. we, we, we build that when we bought that is because we want to do deep profiles. So, but if you do a uh, coastal, you don't need that. You, better, you, you can you can provide uh, other power. So the, yeah, the sensor itself, right. 20, 30 pounds. And uh, I guess we didn't uh, list. It's about uh, eight watts. Right. Eight watts for for uh, continuous measurement. Right. So when we run this in the lab, it's just 12 volt DC. It's not a problem for us to run at all. Now we're moving on into the projects that recently just um, got, were selected and so they aren't as far along. Um, we'll start with Dr. Bull. Okay, hi. So my name is Wally Fulweiler and I'm at Boston University in the Department of Earth and Environment and the Department of Biology. And this project is focused on trying to understand impacts to nitrogen cycling in estuarine sediments um, in regards to coastal acidification. <clears throat> so, that's always a good start. <laughs> so it's all black um, and doom, but no it's not. Um, so when we think about open ocean co uh, acidification, we're worried about CO2 impacts. But when we move to coastal systems, it's really all driven by metabolism. So our estuaries have been basically dealing with acidification since we started dumping nutrients into them in the early 1900s, some cases late 1800s. Um, this is a nice figure by Duarte et al. in 2013 that kind of shows how um, the scales that you're working on um, varies also with the pH changes um, in time. So typically in systems that are shallow, we see changes in pH that are much greater um, than are predicted even 100, 500, 1,000 years out for the open ocean. Um, <clears throat> so if we're looking at a maximum change in the open ocean of around 0.7 pH units, sort of maybe, you know, worst case scenario, um, coastal systems see this kind of change on a daily basis. <clears throat> um, so here's a good example of that. This is from the long-term monitoring data in the Laquite Bay National Estuary Research Reserve where you see water column pH at two different sites. Sage Lot Pond is sort of a, I wanna say pristine, but there's really no pristine place, but it's a very um, clean place, not a lot of nitrogen coming in, um, surrounded by salt marsh. So you can see the pH changes here in 24 hours um, are, are you know, still a pretty big change, but all, all a nice, safe pH. Um, the toxic point's a little bit different and very variable, and you can see that it varies instead between 7 and 7.4, 7.6, so all changing over a dial cycle. Um, there are other systems where these swings can be even greater. So basically, the more nitrogen that we're adding, the more primary production that's occurring, the more uh, respiration then breaking down that organic matter, and the larger the pH swing you're going to see over a 24-hour cycle. <clears throat> so um, I think that this makes these systems, these sediment systems really ideal places to look at sort of fundamental ecological questions when it comes to ocean acidification. 
So there's a nice paper by Yonke and Halls, who I now can't find the, the year on, um, where they say that ecosystems that are regularly exposed to low pH conditions, maybe they're going to be more um, pushed past these tipping points, or do they possess some sort of elasticity that makes them more likely to adapt to changing conditions. So we have these estuarine systems and the sediments are exposed to these really rapid changes over 24-hour cycles and over seasonal cycles in pH. And maybe these sediment systems can act for us as proxies to try to understand future change. The, the way we're going to sort of ask or answer this question is going to be focused on the nitrogen cycle. Um, I'm not going, to, going to, to bore you all with all of it, but anytime you want to talk about nitrogen, let me know because I adore it. Um, so this is um, a water column and then the sediments here, and there's lots of different ways to make nitrous oxide. Um, <clears throat> this is a bad thing because nitrous oxide is a super powerful greenhouse gas, 300 times more powerful than CO2, and it's also currently the number one ozone depleting substance. Um, so here we go. So in um, sediments and estuaries, um, this process of denitrification takes a biologically usable form of nitrogen, nitrate, and converts it to what we call an inert, an inert form N2, which is our, our atmosphere, right? It's about 78% N2 gas. So the sediments, the microbial community in these sediments are doing this natural cleansing process for us. So they can remove this excess nitrogen um, and turn it into N2 gas. That's great, because if you want to get rid of coastal acidification, the way you want to do that is to get rid of the nitrogen that's making the primary production that's then respired that lowers the pH. Um, so that's sort of a key process that we want to focus on. Unfortunately, if the microbes that are doing denitrification get stressed out, and they can get stressed out for a variety of reasons, like they're exposed to low pH, then they won't move um, this biological form of nitrogen to N2, and instead they make nitrous oxygen. How are we doing? It's like a lot pretty quick. <laughs> so um, basically, um, this, um, this is a, we know this from a lot of work done in agricultural, um, agricultural fields and a little bit in forest work. So here is just an example where you're looking at soil pH and then you're looking at the ratio of the amount of nitrous oxide produced um, over the total amount of, of sort of denitrification, so the end removal. And you can see that as you move to lower pHs, you create more and more nitrous oxide. Now, I don't think we're going to get here. <laughs> um, I, I certainly hope we, we don't get there. Um, but we do know that sediments can experience a pretty variable pH. So um, what happens, what's going on here, like why this occurs, is because the enzyme that's responsible for um, taking nitrous oxide and turning it N2 is really, really um, sensitive to pH. So it's fully functional at seven, and then pH five, it's completely unfunctional. So it goes from like working pretty well to, to not working very well, and that's why you see this nice big kick up. All of this work, however, or the, primarily this work on denitrification um, has been done on land, and we don't know if this applies, uh, this pH relationship applies um, to, to marine sediments, but I have well, the whole idea here is that, of course, it does. Why would it not? The microbes are all related. Um, so, for example, there's um, pH can vary. Um, this, is a, this is a fairly pristine system. So this would be like that sage lot pond system. So as you move through the sediments, you get a decrease in pH, but all within that range of where we think um, it would, the denitrifiers would still be producing N2 and not nitrous oxide. Here's sort of a neat map just showing you how variable pH can be. This is um, in two to three centimeters, so basically the surface centimeters. Um, then we can say, okay, so if we know that this enzyme can be uh, basically inhibited by low pH, creating more nitrous oxide, why is this happening? And the thought primarily is that it's all, um, it's all sort of related to the microbial community that is there. So there's been some work in lake sediments that shown that the microbial community is really responsive to pH. And so as you shift the pH in lake sediments, then you change the, the, the sort of the number, basically think of this as like um, the number of like the taxonomy, right, the diversity in these sediments. So as you move away from sort of basic pH to this low pH, you get a different um, number of organisms. And in fact, you can see this in, in sort of different sequencing. So our goal then for this project is to try to understand um, how coastal acidification will alter the sediment microbial community composition. Again, this has been done in forests and in farm fields, but hasn't been done in marine sediments yet. Um, we think that it's gonna decrease um, the overall rate of nitrogen removal through denitrification, and it's gonna increase the rate of nitrous oxide production. 
So we and my lab um, do a lot of biogeochemical work. Um, we can measure all gases from sediments and in the order column. Um, and we're going to combine this with molecular work. So we're going to know both the form and function of the sediment community. Um, year one is really going to be doing sort of footprint analyses. We're going to go to different sites that are exposed to these different pH conditions. And we're going to look at who the microbial community is. Um, so the total sort of composition of that community, looking at the DNA, and then we're going to look at the active community. So not just who is there in general, but who is actually turned on and doing things, um, like making nitrous oxide. Um, so we'll do a full sequencing um, for both um, the DNA and the RNA using basic, uh, pretty standard techniques. Um, I just want to take one moment to talk about why we care about total and active communities, and this is a really nice paper um, from Kearns et al. that came out last year. Um, they're looking at sediment here, and then they're looking at the water column. Um, the circles are the rRNA gene, and then the 16S, the triangles, are just um, the rRNA. Um, so you're looking at both the DNA and the RNA here, and what's really neat, I think, is that all here, this is the DNA in the water column, and this is the DNA in the sediment. And then this is the RNA in the water column, and this is the RNA in the sediment. Okay, so this is like total composition, everyone there, everyone here, and then this is the group that's turned on. And they did this over a 24 hour cycle. What's really neat here is that there's not, um, the change in the sediments is certainly not driven by, by the time here for what they were looking at, um, but in the water column it is. Um, so this actually, if you were to plot like a timeline on this, they basically, the, they start here in the morning and the sediments go all the way, oh, I know that's right, where's the yellow, yeah. They go all the way up and around and make a complete circle here. So they start at one place in the morning and then they sort of chomp through the day and they come back at the next morning in the same location. Um, the, here in the sediments, they did this and they took the top few centimeters and just homogenized them. And I think that they missed sort of the power. I think all this spread here is because in sediments, especially um, estuarine sediments, most of the action is taking place in the top few centimeters to millimeters. Um, so we're gonna be doing a finer scale look at this. Um, and es especially if we think that a system is exposed to low pH because of the water column acidification that's happening, then the sediments in the top layers are going to be, um, are gonna be the ones that are most impacted. So, this spread, I think, is because they homogenize so much of the sediment. Um, so the first year is really going to be doing this kind of footprint analysis at these different sites. And then the second year, we're going to do some experimental work um, where we will um, set up this system after Reichman et al. Um, and we're going to change the pH um, um, in the water above sediments from different sites. We will um, measure the pH with unisense microprofiling probes. Um, and we will measure a range of other things, including um, the amount of nitrous oxide and the N2 gas that's produced. We will do the 16S again on these sites, so we'll get the total community active and, and total. Um, and then we're gonna go after the specific genes that actually drive these changes. Um, I wanna do this because it's not, I think, just enough to know um, the total community and who's active and who's not. I really wanna know who's driving this nitrogen cycling process. Um, and, and how that's changing to exposed pH, um, to expose low pH, and then we're gonna link this to the N2 and nitrous oxide um, gas fluxes, so we'll both be able to say who is there, who is active, who is specifically doing this denitrification, and how are they responding to low pH. Um, the larger sort of whole point of this is not only is it answering ecological questions about how sediments change when they're exposed to low pH and the coastal acidification, but it will allow us to be able to um, help people sort of better design things like aquaculture farms or conservation of microbial communities, um, going after function, which we don't tend to, to do right now when we talk about conservation and we talk about how to make resilient ecosystems. So that's the plan. Thank you.
So uh, today I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the early stages of this project. And uh, the seeds of this project were kind of sown with an earlier uh, MITC grant that was focused on looking at the effects of acidification and warming on uh, mollusks, mollusk calcification and growth. <clears throat> so it's kind of going to be it's going to be framed in the context of actually what I presented uh, this morning, which was the uh, kind of the concluding uh, presentation for that uh, that grant proposal, uh, that grant uh, project. So this is a collaboration uh, with Carolina, uh, Carolina Bastidas uh, here at MIT Sea Grant, and the three graduate students who have already uh, started to work on this project, Louise Cameron, uh, Lisa Spiegel, <coughs> and Jess Gould, all at Northeastern. And we're out at the Marine Science Center on the hot, not, not here in Boston. All right, so everybody's probably familiar with this, but I still like to uh, show this uh, this history of our understanding of atmospheric CO2 because it, it does inform the way we design our experiments. So um, I think some people have already shown this uh, million year curve for CO2 fluctuating in a relatively narrow range between two and 300, actually driven by, uh, not the cause of, but driven by glacial cycles, unlocking and locking up um, the, the, um, the soil carbon cycle uh, in the tundra uh, as you move in and out of uh, uh, glacial cycles. Over, since the Industrial Revolution, we've, uh, we've deviated from that uh, by about 30% uh, due to uh, deforestation, fossil fuel production, and uh, cement production primarily. And then, as everybody knows, over the next uh, century, the 100 to 200 years, we're predicted to increase uh, threefold from pre industrial levels up to 900. Uh, give or take a couple hundred uh, microatmospheres. Um, so if you take those those uh, CO two predictions and uh, and you equate them with different bodies of water, here is the Southern Ocean as an example, uh, which has relatively low alkalinity and is uh, relatively colder than other bodies of water. You actually end up with seawaters that become undersaturated with respect to aragonite, which is one of the minerals that mollusks use to build their, their shells by as early as 2070. Uh, and in estuaries, where you have higher DIC alkalinity ratios and lower salinity, you approach undersaturated conditions even earlier. Uh, in fact, uh, you hit undersaturation every year if you go deep enough uh, in the ocean or if you go uh, into estuaries. So we run all of our experiments um, to span a broad range of PCO2 levels, starting off at pre-industrial levels of 280, going all the way up to 3,000 microatmospheres, because that's what the organisms are seeing today, uh, not in the future. <clears throat> so wide range of organisms produce calcium carbonate shells. General rule on the ocean floor is you're either uh, toxic, invisible, very fast, you produce a hard shell. If you lack any one of those traits, you're not going to survive. But usually, organisms don't invest in more than one of those traits at a time, because they're energetically expensive. <clears throat> it's also one of the reasons why most of the seafood invertebrates we eat are shelled, because they haven't invested in toxicity. <clears throat> so this study focused on, uh, even though we look at a wide range of calcifiers, it's fo focused on uh, bivalve, bivalve mollusks, uh, mainly uh, Vitamus edulis, a uh, blue mussel. Uh, we look at quahogs, soft shell clams, eastern oyster. We also look at a couple species of scallops. Really focusing on the, uh, the commercially important um, New England mollusks. Kind of support MIT Sea Grant's um, you know, mission to engage uh, the communities and in industry. <clears throat> and most, the re like I said before, the reason most of these organisms evolve shells was for protection from predation. Here's a quahog. Uh, it's attempted to be uh, uh, preyed upon by a blue crab. And um, you can see the, the role that this shell plays in protecting uh, its, itself from, uh, from predation by cre uh, crustacean. <clears throat> so the objective of this study was to investigate the impacts of global change, mainly acidification and warming on the very fluid from which organisms, mollusks, are producing their shells. 
So we've done a lot of empirical work, plopping organisms in different CO2 temperatures. Um, and we've seen really a, a wide variety of responses, everything from positive responses to acidification, to parabolic, to negative. And we, we we're really interested in trying to figure out why do you have this wide range of responses, even within a single class, like bivalves. Why do mollusks and lipids, why are they so resilient? Why are uh, cohogs, oysters, and scallops so vulnerable? <clears throat> so we wanted to develop a technique to get into this fluid, to measure it, which exists on micron to millimeter scales. <clears throat> and we wanted to be able to measure all the, the uh, important components of the carbonate system, uh, pH, calcium concentration, DIC, salinity, ultimately to be able to calculate how the saturation state of that, that fluid, what is it like under normal conditions, and how does it respond to CO2-induced acidification and even warmer. Uh, so we're, the plan is to approach, apply this to some commercially important species uh, like I talked about. <coughs> uh, what we've worked, looked at so far have been the uh, Atlantic sea scallop, uh, king scallop, which is kind of uh, sea, sea scallop of, of the British Isles, uh, eastern oyster, and uh, the ocean coag, Arctica Icelandica, also a uh, important proxy species in paleoceanography studies. So most of the work we do is done at Northeastern's uh, Marine Science Center. I have a 72 tank uh, facility that's dedicated to acidification and warm, uh, warming experiments. You can control light, salinity, pH, temperature, a uh, whole host, all, all the relative uh, parameters that are predicted to change in the future. <clears throat> and um, kind of what, what led to this interest in the extrapaleo fluid, I mean, now, now the interest seems obvious, but, but early on, um, part of this work uh, was funded by the first Sea Grant, is we, we did an experiment on some scallops, sea scallops, and we saw they exhibited this kind of typical response to acidification. You know, moderate increases in CO2 have uh, a, a moderate effect on uh, calcification rates, and it's not until you get to extreme CO2 levels, under saturated conditions, do you see a major change in net calcification of the scallops. So that was pretty, uh, pretty predictable. Uh, then we started to look at what actually happens to, to the shell structure under these conditions. So we took the scallops that have been grown under high CO2 low CO2 conditions, high CO2 conditions. Just looking at, at photographs, you can see a difference. The uh, high CO2 of the shell is chalky. A lot of the periostracum uh, has, has flaked away because it loses its attachment point in an outer shell layer. <coughs> and uh, if you look at SEM images, you can see ridges of calcite here. Okay, the ridges are pretty evenly spaced. They have uh, relatively linear. Uh, but under the high CO2 conditions, there's clear signs of, of the dissolution is occurring. Uh, the shell weighed less at the end of the experiment than it did at the beginning. And it's got a, a curved uh, a, a front to these ridges. Uh, components, blocks of calcite are actually missing from the structure. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a heavily modified shell and it's experienced substantial dissolution. But flipping the shell over and looking at the uh, interior, uh, that is the shell directly beneath the mantle, at the site of formation, rather than that new shell on the outside, uh, the, the, sorry, the, uh, the old shell on the outside, <clears throat> uh, you see a, a different story. Here you see a you know, nice euhedral uh, calcite ROMs, well-formed calcite crystals. Uh, that are deposited in that inner layer that's protected under normal CO2 conditions. And under high CO2 conditions, you see basically the same thing. Maybe a little bit of, of etching, maybe slightly so smaller crystals. The scale is the same on both of these uh, electron images. But in general, you have euhedral calcite crystals, well-formed calcite crystals, not the dissolution. So when the, when the tissue is protecting the shell at the site of calcification, they are able to produce calcium carbonate, even in s conditions that are extremely undersaturated, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, with respect to that calcite mineral. So that extrapeleal fluid suggested that fluid is heavily modified. And it's the organism's control over that fluid that allows them to continue building a shell, even though the seawater dictates dissolution. 
Now, they're still dissolving on a net basis. That is, they weigh less at the end of the experiment than the beginning, because even though they're forming new shell under high CO2 conditions, they're losing it faster on the exterior as it dissolves away. That's how you get the negative calcification response. So um, our goal was to get into that fluid that's been shown here in a diagram between the mantle and the shell, the extrapaleo fluid, <coughs> which uh, people have hypothesized that the mollusks are removing protons from and exchanging with calcium and also increasing DIC through respiration from the mantle tissue. All three of those things should actually support calcification by increasing uh, saturation states. <clears throat> and uh, this was all kind of framed within a model uh, I published back in 2011 that really uh, modeled calcifying fluid chemistry at four CO ambient CO2 levels for three hypothetical organisms, a weak proton pumping, moderate proton pumping, and strong proton pumping organism. And, and what the model shows is that just by varying the strength of that proton pump, you, can, you would predict an increase in carbon ion concentration at the site of calcification with increasing CO2 for a strong proton pumping organism. You predict a parabolic response to acidification with moderate control over pH. And with weak control over pH that calcifying fluid, you predict a decline in carbon ion concentration. So you can actually predict positive parabolic or negative responses to acidification just based on the strength of an organism's proton pump. So a pretty parsimonious model with a wide range of, uh, of predictions, which are consistent with the different responses that mollusks actually exhibit. So what does this fluid look like? People really haven't spent a lot of time looking at it. Uh, Crenshaw, back in the 70s, uh, he was at dental school at UNC, was, was interested in this. And that kind of was the end of it, uh, up until uh, acidification took, took the, uh, came front and center in the last few years. So first thing we had to do was figure out what is the nature of this fluid? How stable is it? Can we extract it? How can we measure it? <coughs> and we've just started this project, so we're really kind of at the early stages. This is Arctic Icelandica. They can live 30 to 100 years. There's been a lot of uh, mass water uh, studies that have been based on looking at isotope ratios and elemental ratios in the shells of these long-lived mollusks. <clears throat> so there's, there's other interests also in looking at extra fluid chemistry in these guys. Uh, but we wanted to figure out what was the nature of the extra fluid, how could we access it. Uh, so uh, one of my graduate students, Jess, came up with a really ingenious idea. She uh, added food dye uh, to, to the seawater. Uh, she let the, the Arctic Icelandica take it up. Uh, she took the, the, the clam and she put in liquid nitrogen, instantaneously froze it into a solid mass, and, uh, and then used a petrographic saw. I'm a geologist, so we've got lots of rock saws in the lab, and cut, cut the frozen uh, clam open like a rock. <clears throat> and because everything was frozen, the, um, the structure and the tissues of the organism were kept in their light position. The uh, pink coloration is the food dye that was added to the seawater and brought in through, through the valve of the clam. And it shows that this area is saturated, uh, is completely filled with seawater, while this area here looks like uh, tissue, but is actually frozen extrapaleo fluid. So it's a pretty substantial layer in this species, four to six millimeters in thickness. <coughs> and, when we, uh, and when we drill into the shell, we can insert a port and actually uh, insert electrodes and even extract this fluid for analysis uh, through mass spectroscopy and other uh, analytical techniques. Did the same thing with, with an oyster. In comparison to the clam, uh, which we inserted uh, dye into the water, it took it up, um, sorry, it took it up uh, through this opening here, shows the area where seawater is, which is passing through its its, uh, its, its uh, filtration system. Uh, on the very perimeter, though, you can see an area where the food dye didn't exist. This is frozen extrapaleo fluid. Uh, again, uh, documenting the thickness, and that we can calculate the volume of that fluid, and insert ports, and extract that fluid, and measure it for isotopes and trace elements, salinity, DIC, whatever you want. Uh, this is a, an image of the scallop shell with uh, three of the ports that have been inserted. 
Uh, we use different ports now, Murlocs, so we get a tight seal, but early on we were just using uh, plastic pipette tips. Uh, super glue them in, provides a, a way to access the fluid. We can then insert microelectrodes into the fluid, uh, other uh, techniques. This is just a diagram of that, of that setup. So we've got the shell, the port, the extrapelial fluid, and the tissue with the electrodes inserted. This is kind of an example profile of what we measure. Uh, the extrapelial fluid chemistry uh, had, a, had a pH in this example of about 7.7. .7. Uh, that was pretty stable because these ports were not sealed at the time. So the extrapelial fluid filled these ports. And we didn't measure an increase, or sorry, a decrease in increase in pH until we got up to 8.1, 8.3 in the, the ambient seawater. <clears throat> so this is a, this image of my student Louise uh, using this technique on a different species of scallop. Here's a, this is a, a sea scallop, oh yeah, a king scallop from um, the North Sea, and this shows uh, the seawater pH under the different treatments, 400, 800, and 2,000 microatmospheres CO2. PCO2 uh, decreased from about 7.8 to 7.6 to 7. The open circles show the extra paleo fluid pH that we measured using the microelectrodes. So notably, extra paleo fluid pH decreased with decreasing seawater pH. So it's responding to the acidification in the surrounding water. But notably and surprisingly, the extra paleo fluid pH was lower than the seawater pH, which goes against the whole premise for the study that they're elevating their extra paleo fluid pH above that of seawater to mineralize and to offset the effects of acidification. So the, the fluid that they're precipitating their, their shell from is more acidic than seawater. This didn't make sense. <clears throat> so, uh, at that point, we realized we don't have the whole carbonate system here, and we need, to, we need to measure more of it. So we extracted the fluid. We hooked up a, uh, a syringe, uh, and we extracted that extra paleo fluid from the scallop. And uh, we called Joe Salisbury up, and we said, can we use your, your DIC analyzer, which is able to measure um, very small amounts of seawater. And then we measured the, uh, the DIC of that extra paleo fluid under the different CO2 levels. Now in the seawater, it increased from about 2100 to 2300 up to about 2700. But in the EPF, the DIC absolutely exploded from 2700 up to about 4700, okay? So when you combine those super high DIC levels, which are presumably coming from respiration from the scallop, with those, those pH levels, even though they're lower than seawater level, they're, they're higher than they would be at these DIC levels in equilibrium with that EPF. So they are removing protons from the fluid. They're elevating pH relative to equilibrium with these uh, super high DIC levels. And when you combine that elevated pH and super high DIC from respiration under the acidified conditions, you can calculate the saturation state of the fluid with respect to the calcite mineral uh, of the shell. And in the seawater, the saturation state is going from about 5 down to just under 1, under saturated conditions. But that pH elevation combined with a high DIC actually results in a relatively stable saturation state in the extrapelial fluid. So that's how they're able to keep building those calcite crystals, even under saturated conditions, they're combining high DIC, probably just a result of respiration, with high pH, which together result in a relatively stable pH. That doesn't help them on the outside of the shell. They're still losing it to dissolution. But at least they're able to continue producing it on the inside. And so long as they can produce it on the inside at a faster rate than they're losing it on the outside, they can keep their shell. But under these conditions, we show that that trend reverses. They lose it more quickly than they produce it. Given sufficient time, that shell would disappear. So this is just kind of the beginning. We're going to apply this approach to all the other species we talked about early on, mussels, oysters, anything that we can reliably extract EPF from and measure it. Uh, 
and we're going to uh, use that approach to calculate saturation state with increasing CO2 and even in response to thermal changes. Um, the initial results on the, on the scallop suggest that a uh, combination of, of pH elevation, even though less than seawater, but relative to the equilibrium with, with relatively high DIC within the EPF, allows them to maintain relatively stable saturation states at the site of calcification. And that's how they're able to continue building a shell in undersaturated conditions. And then future work will be aimed at looking at different species and trying to explain interspecific responses uh, using uh, control over EPF chemistry. That's kind of a framework. That's it. Happy to answer any questions. Do you have a sense of how fast that um, the water and the uh, EPF will equilibrate? I mean, how, how uh, so this, effect? let's see, I can. So this was after 30 minutes of so submerging. The exchange of seawater is fast. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's, it's, it's longer than 30 minutes. Oh, okay. So we don't know how, when it actually occurs. But um, so e even after 30 minutes, the, the seawater had still not mixed with the EPF. Because I mean, seawater in the organism is like instantaneous, but across the Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're yeah. just bringing that in yeah. through the routes, you know, pump it right in. But there, the mantle's here, mm -hmm. which separates the calcifying fluid from the, the body of the organism. Um, and we, we, we did another thing is we did sequential extractions of, of the EPF through the port well beyond the volume that we knew was there to see what would happen. And eventually, you actually begin to pull seawater uh, into the EPF under the suction of the uh, syringe. You know, I don't know if we're puncturing it or if it's just going, you know, going through the tissue or around it. But, um, you, you can force it through. That's, that's one thing you have to be careful about when you're extracting the EPF. So we, we use the food dye technique. And as soon as we start to see color, we know that we've gotten into the seawater. Um, so you said the, the respiration, so they keep up the respiration to kind of continue the calcification inside, right? So Well, we don't know. I mean, I'm just assuming the high DIC. So the DIC in the EPF is higher than the DIC in the seawater, and the difference gets greater at higher CO2. So I'm assuming that they're just working harder to pump protons or whatever they're doing to calcify, and that's causing them to respire more, burn, more, burn through more energy. So in other words, I, I guess, I mean, this is the hypothesis, I guess. This, uh, so if you keep them eating well, they keep up the respiration, then I guess they, they, they at least they can continue to calcify, right? To produce it on the inside, yeah. Right. And then, they, but they're, they're losing it on the outside. It's, it's all the balance of gross calcification versus gross dissolution. Um, you know, what's the, the net effect of that? Is there any reason to believe that aquaculture versus wild caught um, species, or within the same species, might be behaving differently with this this characteristic? Uh, I, I mean, it really depends on you know what they've done to the uh, aquaculture species. Have they selected for resilience to you know thermal stress or pH stress? Um, I don't know. My, my gut would tell me. I mean, I, don't, I really don't know. We didn't look at any aquaculture species. It re really depends on how much selective pressures that have put on those populations. Thanks. So I'm Bob Chen from the School for the Environment at UMass Boston, and Francesco Perry is the engineer on the project, and Shannon Davis is the chemist student. Uh, and Brissette is with Mass Bays, and so she um, works with the stakeholders. And so one question about ocean acidification, or you might call it coastal acidification in this case, um, is who cares? And the answer is maybe the denitrifying bacteria, and maybe the oysters and scallops, uh, and maybe the aquacultural uh, fishermen. 
So uh, we're, we're working with the aquaculture industry. Um, and this initial part was funded by um, uh, Mass Bay's um, National Estuary uh, Program. Uh, sea Grant's sort of continuing that. Um, and so um, that was it's money that's passed through from the EPA. Um, so you haven't seen this before, right? So <laughs> um, CO2 has a certain variation, uh, but the variation in PCO2 and pH is higher in the ocean than uh, it is in the atmosphere, so there's a lot of variation. Um, and then when you go to the coasts, um, this was the open ocean variation, and this is the coastal variation. So you get much higher variation in PA, uh, this is PCO2 uh, and pH, the open ocean variability, and the pH variability in the coastal waters, and this is in not really that near shore, it's coastal water in Washington. But if you go cur further into an estuary, you can go from, you know, pre-industrial 280 to 1200 or higher. Uh, and so there's a lot of variation, and we heard from, from Alec that, you know, 15 minutes is better than 60 minutes, because if you want to calculate things when water is moving back and forth tidally, uh, it changes the flux, for example. Uh, so you want to have very high measurements of this rapid variability. Uh, and we want to understand really what the extreme is, because it's often the extremes that affect people and organisms and um, are they resilient, you know, oh, I forget who it was. <laughs> well, like, uh, it, it, can, you, can, you re, can you be resistant to one low pH impact or several low pH, and how many does it take to push over a tipping point or threshold to sort of affect your sort of growth and your productivity and sort of all that stuff. So um, in, in the very near shore waters where aquaculture happens, you know, at the dock or a few hundred meters offshore, um, there's widely varying temperatures. Um, the winds can affect things like upwelling, and you can get really high uh, PCO2 waters coming on shore um, and, and have a, an episode for a few hours. Um, and that is tidally mixed, and it can be mixing in an estuary where you have fresh water over salt water, and the salt water can have a different uh, pH than the fresh water, and as that tidally mixes, you can get excursions over the course of uh, minutes. Um, <clears throat> we heard that biology has a lot to do with it. Productivity um, can drive CO2 high or drive CO2 low, and there's a diurnal cycle sort of to that. Um, and freshwater discharge actually lowers pH significantly by lowering the buffering capacity and also increasing the acidity to the, to the system. So um, in an estuary, you have all of those things sort of coming on. And then, then, then there could be a lot of um, biogeochemistry happening in the wetlands, and then the water can exchange with water that's in the wetlands, and that can flow over your oysters uh, and affect the, what they see. And so we're trying to measure you know, the, the chemistry, the pH, the PCO2, the whole carbonate chemistry in where the oysters are um, growing, where the hatchery is sucking water from, and where they're sitting on the bottom uh, for that sort of whole life stage. And so that's sort of the goal of this project. Um, um, I refer to the, the biologists that are doing experiments with the 72 tanks um, to figure out uh, what the impacts are, and this is really interesting, thank you for that talk, uh, in terms of, you know, how it relates to what they're actually sort of doing. Um, but uh, the, 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 the aquaculture industry in Duxbury is $5 million a year. Um, and they're interested in what ocean acidification, what coastal acidification might, how it might impact them. Maybe how it impacts their current practice. Maybe how it impacts where their kids should grow oysters. Is this Duxbury Harbor doomed in 50 years and maybe we should look to another place? Um, now, mm, everything's working good, I'm good, but when do we expect the, the tipping point to hit and then I gotta worry about it and maybe I should be ready for that collapse in that year or avoid that collapse in that year uh, when we're sort of looking. Um, so, um, so you've sort of seen all this stuff, this multiple stressor idea of you can overcome the low pH if you have enough food to produce uh, more um, uh, respiration uh, in, that, in that fluid. Um, sort of all sort of those things, and there's, it's a complex system. There's, there's pathogens and temperature effects and sort of all that stuff. So um, <clears throat> our approach is to measure um, the carbonate system. Uh, we're using uh, off-the-shelf sort of um, uh, uh, sunburst sensors in PC, pH and PCO2. We're starting in Duxbury where there's a large uh, interest in, in uh, oyster aquaculture, large, large industry, and then moving to the ARC dock at, at uh, Barnstable Harbor. Um, and potentially this system is movable to sort of wherever we sort of might go, but we're sort of aiming at 
um, the aquaculture um, farmers. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the question really is, what's the variability? Can we understand the variability and how it affects oyster growing? Um, and can we understand them now and in the future? And if we can predict what is driving the absolute extreme lows and how long the lows are and when they sort of come, we might change the practice of, of oyster farming. So we need to work with them uh, and we need to present as we get data to them to say, does this mean anything to you? <laughs> when, what are your practices? When do you pump water? Oh, we treat all our water anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, we, we then put them out uh, in this day, but we could wait a week if we think there's a low. If, if you measure a low or you predict a low uh, pH sort of event. Um, and then this longer term thing of, you know, what's the long term vi viability, sustainability of this business in that particular area? Or are there other areas or other species that we should be thinking about? Um, and, and there's a statewide Massachusetts shellfish initiative that is thinking about how we do regulations for, of the wild caught and aquaculture uh, grown uh, species throughout the state instead of town by town. <laughs> and, and ocean acidification, coastal acidification plays a role in that. So we want to understand the, the variability in how that affects sort of those decisions and that, those regulations. <clears throat> so we know that we can calculate sort of any two and, um, and there's commercial available ones and now it's trying to make more commercially available ones. This is great. Um, but if you um, take CO2 cysts sort of instantaneously on any of these two, you can, you can get all four and you can get the aragonite saturation value. Uh, sort of reporting out. Um, the pH tells you on this graph where along the x-axis you are, so it can tell you what the different species are. The um, total titration alkalinity is sort of the combination of the bicarbonate, the carbonate, so how much of this side of the graph there is, so it sets, sets the amplitude in a sense. Um, <coughs> where my, oh, I Hard to see. So this one is the, um, sorry, the DIC, or the total CO2 is the, the amplitude as well. So, um, and then the PCO2 is how much of this, this particular species. So any of these are giving you the amplitude, this is giving you the x-axis, and between the x and the y-axis you can tell you where you are on this graph, and you define all the species, um, and, um, and which ones were more accurate in terms of, you know, the lower sort of the error of measuring the whole system. Um, Ultimately, uh, the, the oyster guys are interested in the saturation state of aragonite. So are you undersaturated or oversaturated, and how much, and how much stress is there on, from the acidification side on the, on the organism? Um, OK, so <clears throat> um, we're designing um, a uh, dock-mounted uh, telemetry real-time every 15 minutes. Uh, based on sunburst sensors, we and, and because we're in very coastal waters, turbid waters, biofouling, uh, lots of variability, um, we're using a, a flow-through um, pH sensor. Um, we want to know mostly the water and the upwellers and all those things are at the surface water, so we have a floating um, platform where the pump is located, and the dock is stable because we want to measure year-round, so there's a pressure head difference that occurs with tide, and so we have to compensate for flow. Um, and, um, and then uh, PCO2, we're using a shower head equilibrator, the, uh, sunbur uh, the uh, sunburst uh, super CO2. Um, so again, we're taking that water, pumping it up onto the dock, running it through these two sensors in parallel, um, and, and a CTD and CDOM and other things, because you can do that <laughs> while you get the water up there. Um, and then we're integrating them in, in the, sort of this box. Uh, and then dumping the water back uh, in, into, the, into the ocean. And we're trying to design it so it can work in the winter, which is really tough. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and um, we have sort of this telemetry. So um, it looks like this. We've built a, a box with, and we've insulated to maintain sort of temperature control. There's the laptop. Um, I think there's another picture here. Um, uh, this is the uh, equilibrator units over here, and the pump water comes in here, it runs through the system. The pH is sort of underneath. Uh, there's calibration get CO2 for calibration gases that run every hour or however you want, often you want to run it. And so it's pretty, it's designed to be pretty maintenance free. We're planning on taking samples every couple weeks to do that, you know, more often in the beginning to make sure it all works right. Um, and. Um, and then we're going to duplicate that for the barnstable one. So, so a lot of the development stuff sort of is, is done. Um, <clears throat> we plan on 
taking this real-time data, storing it on board, telemetering it through a cell phone network to UMass Boston server, and then serving it up on the Niraku's uh, site. Um, and so this should be sort of relatively real-time user-friendly for the fishermen to sort of look at it um, and tell us what they think, if it's useful. Um, so <clears throat> the big thing is there's short-term variability and there's long-term variability. We want to sort of portray and communicate both of those things uh, to the aquaculture industry. We want to work with them with translating this data so they can see it in a way that sort of impacts. We want to use this information to the biologists to tell us what, you know, are their thresholds and when might they really worry about things. There's different um, times that the oysters are sort of exposed to, either the water being pumped into their hatchery, then they put them out in these upwellers, and so where they put the upwellers and when they put them out uh, matters. Uh, then they take them and put them in mesh bags, and when they change that, they can actually take them in for the winter and have them just shut down for the winter and put them back if conditions are bad in the winter. And they just do that sort of, the fishermen, they just think, I guess. It's a lot of effort, but they, and so maybe they can, you know, maybe this can inform some of that. Uh, and then they put them on the bottom for a while, and when they harvest, so, so they, there's these different sort of life stages, and each of them could be affected by, uh, I think, particularly the extremes in the, um, uh, in the pH mix. And so, um, we're using sort of proven PDH pieces to be less flexible in terms of depth in the open ocean because we want to make sure that they are reliable with the biofouling and the, and the turbidity issues. Um, we're putting it on this sort of dock here um, and we're designing it for sort of that dock where, where the, the close to where the hatcheries are and the oyster fishermen are sort of putting their, uh, their oyster. We're using standard cyber infrastructure and, and integrating with Niraku's sort of portals um, and that's it. I'm Jack Cook, and this uh, presentation concerns a project that is a little more hardware-oriented, but is developing sensors that hopefully will be useful to a number of you. The project is concerned with making measurements between the surface and the bottom, and we're going to use temperature as our starting point. And, uh, So today I'd like to briefly <coughs> go over the, the nature of our problem, how we're approaching a solution for it, and uh, give some results. We've just started this year, so there's not too much, but there is definitely a good start and what our plan is for the near future. Um, this is a, a, a map of the surface temperatures uh, of the ocean, global, and what we're interested in is what's going on below the surface. So our core question is, what will we find in terms of temperature variations? Uh -huh. I did it, didn't I? <laughs> that way. Uh, OK. What will we find under the, under the surface? And uh, so our, our problem is twofold. One, we want to get quite a bit of data, like uh, uh, lots of data points in time and in space. And we need to be able to communicate that data to, the, to us outside of the ocean. Um, the process that um, some people think of is to put in sensors and run wired networks to carry the data, but our approach is that uh, we need to be far more economical and long-term reliable and be able to work in a greater range of environments, so we'd like to have a wireless communication. Uh, underwater communications have been uh, developed and four different modes of communication have been, uh, can, are considered and are used. Um, the top one is one we'll be looking at. It's called um, our uh, magnetic uh, induction method. The other three are electromagnetic 
acoustic, and optical. Um, the range uh, I've identified varies according to the type of communication technique that's used. Electromagnetic has the least range, acoustic perhaps the longest, uh, or definitely the longest, and optical kind of uh, in between. Magnetic insulation turns out to be close to optical, but not be influenced by the difficulties of optical communication. So we've looking especially at this magnetic uh, in, uh, induction technology. It's relatively immune compared to other techniques from the ambient conditions. So it's immune to temperature, it's immune to multipath, how the data gets between where it's transmitted to where it's received. It's not influenced by fouling as best we know, but we're going to find out more about that because magnetic fields are not influenced by uh, plants and organization uh, and uh, sediments, etc. And of course, it's not influenced by optical uh, uh, effects or uh, other noise that's typical in, in, uh, or disturbances typical in, in the ocean environment. We expect it to be reduced power from calculation and we'll learn it by experiment because unlike uh, an optical, a mechanical acoustic system, you're not physically moving water. You're generating a magnetic field, which is done, which is very efficient to do. There seems to be, we expect very little impact on marine life because the magnetic fields we use are really low. They're very small. Uh, they, they can approach the level of Earth's magnetic fields and, and much below. It's a technology that hasn't been used a lot in the ocean environment, but it has been used for underground transmission in mines and uh, caves and other, thing, other areas. So we're adapting some of those concepts to, our, to the ocean uh, arrangement. So our first year approach is to look at, at it from a fairly scientific engineering point of view. We're going to use calibrated magnetics so we know exactly how much field we're producing, how much is being lost. We're quantifying the attenuation in the water uh, uh, very accurately as a function of, of distance and frequency of operation. Um, we're developing uh, magnetic sources and receivers, transmitters and receivers, in order to make this as, mo as, as efficient as possible and developing data encoding schemes that are uh, convenient for magnetic uh, induction. So our first year status, we've just started, so we've done well with the uh, initial part of characterization, as I will show you, and we've made good progress already on each of these, and we see no problem with proceeding further. So now some details. Um, I think I'll skip that for time. Visually, uh, you could the concept would be to have sensors that are anchored in position and that they have a transmitter built into them and a receiver can be placed either periodically to collect that data over a, uh, that might be accumulated over a week or a month and uh, that data receiver would be carried by a surface vehicle in, in this particular case. So that uh, we're not seeking to necessarily transmit this data over kilometers of distance because magnetic induction is not good for kilometers, but it's certainly good for 100 meters and maybe a kilometer. But in any case, the, this is the conceptual view of the, of the demonstration system we'll be putting in in year two. Um, and so a so surface vehicle could be the Rex 4, which could go out and periodically go by different regions where these sensors are, extract the data from it, and um, we would then all have it. Um, key parameters that we're seeking to look uh, to achieve would be at least a hundred meter or more communications range. Um, a lot, multiple sensor, temperature sensors uh, arranged in an array at a location in the Boston Harbor region. 
um, modest data rates in order to keep efficiency, but we'll see based on experimental results whether we can push that up, but it's a typical standard rate for uh, low speed data. Uh, temperature does not need to be a high data rate in order to receive lots of data from it. It's not like an image. Uh, we seek high efi efficiency so that uh, without any in influence, we can easily demonstrate at least a month, but we'd like to go for a year of unattended operation and uh, without recharging the batteries that are driving the system. And uh, we seek to have this be a good foundation for designing a larger or more extensive sensor arrays. Conceptually, the data input from the, from the sensors uh, get encoded and amplified and transmitted with a transmitter coil. And then uh, there's that gap of water. The receive coil uh, receives that magnetic field. Coils are used because they're very efficient at both transmitting and receiving magnetic energy. So they're uh, an effective way of doing that. The signal is amplified, decoded, and the data comes out. Okay. Um, so we're starting with the, the path loss part of the project. We have a fish tank set up. We're making measurements over a wide range of frequencies because we want to explore the entire possible range of data rates that would be transmitted. We have calibrated measurements, as we'll show you. This is the similar, but it's the basic structure for calibrating where we put in a, a very well-known source. We have a highly calibrated receiver, and we can detect any losses that occur on the way. The experimental system that's been set up is just in a fish tank at the moment, but it, 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 concerns, it consists of a uh, transmit coil driven by a source of uh, energy and a receive coil which goes through an amplifier and uh, proceeds. There's physics behind the design of each component. Uh, there's some equations. The key is, the key, why this is important, is that the amount of magnetic field that's transmitted is proportional to the number of turns in the coil and the area of the coil. And so you can scale accordingly if you know how to scale. And this gives you great scaling relationships. From a signal strength point of view, the result of that, uh, that magnetic field uh, in, is that if we go out to a 100 meter range, we need a signal, we'll lose a factor of a million in signal strength. But a factor of a million in electronic terms is not bad. And we can easily uh, re detect and receive that, that small signal. Again, equations, but the, the core idea is for the receive coil, there's also a set of coil parameters that define its, its sensitivity. And we can change the sensitivity or increase the sensitivity of the receive coil. Calibration, we use something called the Helmholtz coil, but it all makes for highly calibrated results. This is one of the amplifiers and the amplifier characteristics. The figure I want to get to is, this is the measured versus experimental results of the detection of the magnetic flux as a function of frequency going from a low of around 500 hertz to 500 kilohertz. So we've, we have in place already a, the beginnings of the ability to uh, quantify the uh, transport of magnetic energy from a transmitter to a receiver. What we'll do is we'll add water to the tank and then the received signal will no longer be what, the, what this, this is in air and that difference is the path loss. So we have to face noise. Everybody faces noise of some kind or another but uh, we've got around it. This is about it's good for the next time. It's about how you uh, 
uh, encode the data. We have experience with putting electronics into the tanks, uh, in, into the seawater. So in the near term, we'll uh, quantify the path loss for a meter distance in lab, 10 meters of dockside, and in the harbor, 30 to 100 meter range. We'll develop our encoding and decoding and uh, demonstrate that we have a working system. Thank you. <laughs> but our real goal is to be able to provide uh, continuous data about undersea conditions. And it need not be temperature. This is used as a, as a demonstration vehicle. It means you have to have sensors, as people well know, for any other variable you want to be able to measure. But the mechanism by which we could move that data from the undersea location to the surface is uh, the commonality in this project. Are, are you thinking you can hop the data, like a buoy every 100 meters or something? That's another possibility. Um, there's several possibilities for Right now, we're just trying to go directly from wherever <laughs> we are on the ground to the, to the surface. But there are schemes for hopping. There are schemes to sending it to a sort of a centralized <clears throat> buoy to send it to a satellite. So I think we're, we're not wedded to any one solution, but this is just the, the, the real hard part is getting it out of the water. And once you get it to the surface, it's a, it's, it's a much, because electromagnetic waves propagate in the air just fine. They don't propagate, they like this, that's it, and they don't go into, into, into the ocean. So that's the hard part. And we'll use any, any other solution after that. And I, I presume low frequency motions of the receiver will not affect the, the measurement. That's correct. The, the, the motion of the, of the ocean is uh, not an impact on the, on the magnetic field. <clears throat> That's one big advantage of the magnetic induction method is, is it really is relatively immune compared to every other uh, process. This round is our fourth round of doing a targeted research call, and part of doing that targeted research call is encouraging all of our funded researchers to collaborate and work together, and, and so these meetings are one way in which we facilitate that. So please feel free to reach out uh, at any point. Um, I'm the communicator here. I'm happy to talk to any of you at any point, but <laughs> I love talking about your research, and uh, if I can help promote or connect you with stakeholders, um, we would Thank like you. also to have your presentations. I have yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, a couple of things. Uh, and anyway, yeah. 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 I know she was yeah. recording yeah. too. Yeah. So um, there are a YouTube channel. Yeah, we're on it. Yeah, we're going to be meeting your vote. So you're going to be meeting your vote. They have a town doc. We could put the first one. Yes, that's the first one. Okay. 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 Because they have not collected dollar there. Well, we can have a very harsh one. We don't need a lot. No. We got to drive. Right now, we don't have a control area. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Hey, you're right about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the,